All right, and we're live. Awesome. Gino, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? Gabe, I'm doing great. And there is no better place to be than the Real Estate Investing Club. One of my favorite types of clubs, my friend. Got to let you know that. <laughs> I love the plug. I love the plug. Um, awesome. To get us started, why don't you tell everybody listening, watching who you are, where you're from, and how you got started in real estate in the first place. Sure. I think, Gabe, before we start, I think two things. First thing, really, I'm honored to be on the show. I appreciate you inviting me on to share the message. The second thing I think is the theme for the podcast should be done is better than perfect. <laughs> Let that sink in, everybody. Just I commit, love it. and then we figure it out. I love Tech it. dummies over here. We figured out, let's try this live streaming thing and it's going to work. And that's what I think life's all about. Don't get into the analysis paralysis. You need to figure it out. You need to take some massive education, but then it's got to be followed by action, right? We can educate ourselves all we want. Gabe can be sitting over there looking at this live stream. How does it work? Sooner or later, you have to hit the button, take that massive action, and you're going to get results. The actions may not get you the results you want, but that's what learning is all about. That's what shedding your ego and finding others and helping others to help you down the path is all about. And I held Gabe accountable. I said, Gabe, we're going to make this happen today. So he figured it out, hit the button, and here we are. So, and the reason, um, the, the reason Gino said that is this is the first time we're actually going live. This is the first attempt at it, and it looks like it is working. So um, it is going to be released everywhere. It is normal normally released on the podcast on YouTube, but Facebook customers, you guys are, you're first in line, you're seeing us live. So glad to have you here. <laughs> so yeah, Gino, um, take us away, uh, who you are, where you're from, how you got started in real estate. Well, I am from New York, left New York three years ago. I immigrated, memigrated, where you're going to say down to Florida. Um, and I saw it. I saw the coronavirus happening. That's what happened. I said, I'm leaving New York. And I wish I did. I wish I was that smart. I wish I had that crystal ball, but I didn't. I just said to myself, I don't want to be in New York. I don't want to be where the high taxes are. I don't want to be with snowing. I don't want to be where the cost of living and everything. And I decided, and we have a great system. If you don't like living in a state, you can move. Best country on the planet. At least that's my opinion. People are still moving here. The opportunity here is amazing. Uh, I was in the restaurant business for over 20 years. I had a mom and pop place with my, with my parents uh, back in 94. I graduated college and we bought the restaurant and I loved it. Did it for about 20 years. Uh, back in 2007, my dad passed away. Um, I, one of my big inflection points in life, looking back at it now, you know, Father's Day had just passed and I'm thinking about it. When he passed away, something uh, was taken from me. You know, I mean, I worked with my dad since I was eight years old in the restaurant. It was part of my life. It was part of his dream and it was part of my dream, but I think it was more of his dream than mine. And I loved it. I liked it, but 08 comes. And I, I really looking back at it now, 08 is very similar to the pandemic right now. How are you reacting to the pandemic? Is it a problem or is it an opportunity? We've seen a lot of opportunities out of it. And back in 08, it was a huge problem, the great recession for me, but there was also an opportunity to really step up my game. And why is a person like Gabe Peterson making millions of bucks and Gino's not? It's, there's got to be reasons why people are successful while they're not. And I wanted to know why. And I really dove into personal development. I dove into coaching. I looked for a mentor in real estate. And I wanted multifamily. I wanted to make quote unquote passive income because I was working harder and making less. And I saw multifamily real estate as that vehicle. I had crapped out on a single, uh, single uh, on a uh, mobile home park. I had crapped out on a mixed use building. It took me 10 years to get out of that deal. And really not enough education there, massive action, but I didn't have the education. So that's when I decided to double down. And I just also said to myself, am I building my dad's dream or am I building my dream? I was really, real, really honest with myself. Dove into personal development, went to become a certified life coach. That was a real turning point in my life because I got clarity. I finally figured out and focused on what I wanted, not what I didn't want. And I wanted that passive income. I wanted that financial freedom, but I wanted a lifestyle, right? We, are, we build our businesses for our lifestyles instead of building our lifestyles for our businesses. And I wanted real estate and multifamily specifically to be really for lifestyle. So I could move to Florida. I could go to the beach. I can be at a podcast with Gabe at three o'clock and then go to the beach with my kids right after, right? And work on Saturday or decide not to. And that's one of the things I think that multifamily or real estate lends to you if you have the vision and you have, you have the goals and the clarity. And obviously for me, one of the biggest parts was meeting Jake back in 2011, partnering with him, 
having that instant mastermind, that instant accountability partner, that instant buddy that really helped me out through a lot of this and sharing resources, sharing that, you know, the ups and the downs. Because if you don't have enough reasons, reasons reap rewards. If you don't have enough of those reasons, all of a sudden something happens like the pandemic and you're like, well, I'm out, right? No, for us, we've doubled down and we've gotten smarter and we've actually made more money during the pandemic and we've seen opportunities. We've been able to work on personal development, work on our internal systems. And it's all the way you look at something. When you look at something a certain way and you can look at it a different way, man, it really changes everything for you. I love it. There were so many awesome gems in there. Um, so I want to kind of, you know, try to uh, summarize what you just said. Um, for everybody listening and watching, it sounds like, so you started out in New York City. Um, it was, you know, high taxes, cost of living through the roof. Um, so you decided to leave that uh, and go down to Florida. Um, and before that, you were working in restaurants with your dad um, for mm -hmm. 20 years, starting in 1994. Um, and then in 2007, you know, tragically, your dad passed away and you started, you know, looking around, you were thinking, okay, what do I need to do? This is not the path for me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I need to find a different way to earn a living. I need to find an, an easier, not easier, but a better way to learn, um, to earn a living. And at that mm -hmm. point, you kind of got into real estate. You kind of started looking into it. Um, multifamily has, has cropped up as the thing that you, that it really hits home for what you're looking for. Um, and, and you got there through all the education that you've given yourself, um, the self-development that you've done. Um, and one thing, well, a few things kind of popped out. Um, you mentioned mobile home parks that you, you kind of, you, that you did a foray into mobile home parks. And that's really mm -hmm. interesting because, uh, mobile home and RV parks is kind of what me and my partners are focusing on right Love now. Love so it, dude. Great niche. You guys are, you guys focus on it because RVs are the way to go because the baby boomers are selling out. They, they want to actually jump in an RV and tour and they can go anywhere they want. That's going to be an amazing space. It's a fragmented space because a lot of mom and pops, there's no one. It's like self-storage was 10 years ago. There weren't that many big operators. They're really fragmented. And mobile home is sort of the same way. I think mobile home has less supply on there. But I messed up with mobile home parks. It wasn't because of the niche. You, you mess up in multifamily. It's not because of the niche, right? It's because you don't know what the hell you're doing in it. I didn't know what I was doing because I didn't know due diligence. I partnered with somebody who was terrible, but ultimately everyone on here, we need to take responsibility for our own actions. Read T. Harv Eker's book, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. Go to the Jake and Gino podcast, listen to the podcast we did with him. I read that book back in 07. I wanted to vomit. I felt like punching him in the face, right? But then I read it again and I'm like, damn, this guy is so right. And you know, you get that feeling when you're reading and you're like, wow. He's right because it's all about responsibility. It's all about our fruits are coming from our roots. How much work do you want to do? How much do you want to learn? It's not about anybody else. It's about taking personal responsibility. And if you want to make a million dollars a year, you need to set your financial thermostat to a million dollars. If you want to make a hundred thousand, you need to set it to a hundred thousand. Now that's simplification. That's oversimplified, but we all have that a process and our behaviors are belief driven. So if we believe that we can make a hundred grand a year, Hey, listen, no offense, whether you're a Trump supporter or a Trump hater, he's a billionaire. His financial thermostat set to billions and people are going to say, well, he went bankrupt, blah, blah, blah. He is a billionaire. He decided to be a billionaire. Now he might've started out with a lot more money than everybody else, but so have a lot of other people and they've lost it. So my whole thought process to that is it's all about what you want and there's no right or wrong answer. Whatever you want for your life is great for you. I wanted to get into my, what we call the third phase of financial freedom. I wanted to be able to write a check and say, Hey Gabe, you want to come see me on vacation? Here's 20 grand. Come and see me. I want that type of financial freedom. I don't need to buy a yacht. I, I don't need to make $17 million a year. That's not where my, that's not where my significance or where my, where my growth and contribution is. That's fine for me. I'm not looking to gain that. So I don't need to buy 20,000 units. I just want to continue on my path. So I challenge everybody out there, figure out what you want in your life, become clear on what you want in your life, hire a life coach and work on yourself. Start peeling back that onion. It's really uncomfortable. It's really difficult to do. That's why most people don't do it. 95% of people who retire, retire broke. I know everyone on this podcast are the remaining 5%. We're going to retire with abundance because we're on podcasts. We listen. We work on ourselves. We plan ultimately, and that's what it's all about. It's all about planning. You know, proper planning presents it prevents piss poor performance. It's so true. If we're not, if we don't plan and we don't really think about what we want in life, it's just going to be random and we can really focus on what we want in life. 
I love it. I love it. And uh, a big theme of everything that you just said is personal responsibility. Um, one of the, the people that I used to, when I was really into personal development, I still am a love personal development, but um, there mm-hmm. was a period in my life when I was really like a hundred percent focused on reading those kind of books. And one of the authors was um, Steve Chandler. And mm-hmm. he had this quote where it was, he was saying, um, Oh shoot, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it here. Um, oh, he's saying no one is coming. He said, it's a hundred percent up to you. You have to go into it with a mindset that no one is coming to save you. You, your, the results are your responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. You can't expect anyone else to bring them to you. You have to go out there and meet them. Um, so I'm, I love that, you know, you share that mindset as well. Gabe, isn't that scary though? At the same time, that's scary for people out there, but it's also empowering because when we have that mindset, we have responsibility, but we have choices and we can actually are are masters of our own fate. We don't have to wait for the government to swoop in and give us a check. During this pandemic, I will tell you where I am focused 100 percent on trying to create financial intelligence because people with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. During this pandemic, if you had a few months of money saved aside, if you had a little bit of cushion, you could take a couple months off and not stress out. There's a lot of people out there that don't have that financial intelligence that have tons of debt. That's the new slavery. I don't care what anybody says. If you are financially incompetent or you can't have any money saved and you're spending more, that's a real, that that you have no choices in life that that's going to pull. You have to go to work. Whereas in during this pandemic, the last three months, did I have to go to work? No, but I love to go to work because I'm able to create so much and there's so much opportunity. And when you don't have to go to work for money, all of a sudden money ends up showing up. I had a mentor who said to me, you know, some people, all they have is money. Some people, how, how did he actually say, he says, some people are so poor, all they have is money. And it's ironic how poor people, all they think about is money. People who are wealthy or financially free. I'm not thinking about getting up in the morning and making money. I'm getting up in the morning and thinking about how how to create value for our education students, for our residents, for our investors, and for our community. That's what my focus is. And the more value that I create, the more money that I make. And it's counterintuitive to to a lot of people who haven't been in business for years, but that's the bottom line. I'm I'm sure you've heard of Zig Ziglar's quote, you know, when you give enough people what they want, you're going to get everything that you want. And it's so hard when you're stuck in the rat race and you have to make that money and you have to pay those bills. What are you focusing on? You're focusing on yourself. But once you become financially free and you're like, you know, I can jump on a call with Gabe and I can help him out and I don't need to get paid. Well, what's going to happen? You keep helping 10 or 15 or 20 Gabes in the world. They're all going to want to help you and they're all going to want to introduce you to their friends. And all of a sudden it starts snowballing, but it really is a mindset. It really is ultimately taking that responsibility. I know. I loved everything you just said because I mean, in my experience in life, money really is a funny thing because Mm -hmm. when you don't have any, you, your automatic urge or your, your instinct is to do all the things that push money away. Like you, Mm -hmm. you just go out there and you focus on money and you just like want to get it and you, and you do everything that you can to, to, to find it. Um, but the problem is you're focusing on the money. You're not focusing on what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, once you have it, you know, it's, it it can either be money is either a slave, uh, it's the biggest slavery or it's the biggest aspect of freedom. Cause once you Mm -hmm. have it, the, the, money itself just kind of drops away. You're not focused on the money itself. You're focused mm-hmm. on the, the actions and, and the results of your actions in society. So, um, Gabe, that's a great point. I mean, I love to get, share a story with everybody real quick. That's why multifamily is really a, a difficult niche for some people. It's not the shiny object syndrome. Don't think you're going to get rich in six months or 12 months or 18 months or two, 24 months. It's really the long game. You know, my father uh, was from Italy. He left because he was a farmer there. You know, you plant a seed, you hope it grows. Multifamily is the same way. You've got to do a lot of work in personal development the same way on the front end. Everyone, picture this. You got to plant the seed. You got to hope you have really fertile soil. You've got to tend the seed. You have to start planting it, watering it. You have to pull the weeds. You have to make sure it grows properly. You pray to God that there's no storms and there's no frost or whatever. And then hopefully, three to six months later, you have a crop. It's the same thing with multifamily. You buy the asset, you nurture it, you make sure that the NOI, you can raise it, you make sure everything's going well. And then what happens? A pandemic hits and it ruins all your plans. That's why you really have to have a contingency. You have to have that long game mindset and that you will persevere. And then you know what? We've been able to refire our money and pull it out and get into the next deal and reinvest. And that's what I think multifamily and entrepreneurship is really to continue to grow your skill set and continue to pivot. The vision's there. The vision's there to re- refi the property or sell the property at a profit, you're going to take different paths to it. But ultimately the vision doesn't change your ability to, to do it does. And I think having that mindset of the long game 
is really hard for us because we're dopamine. We're instant gratification kind of society right now. And that's one of the, two of the problems. I think the lack of responsibility and that instant gratification, everything's so easy. You can buy something on Amazon and have it two days later. I mean, whereas years ago, <laughs> I mean, you, you, it was just so much more difficult to do things. It, it's great in one way because you become so much more efficient, but in another way, everything's so much easier. And you know, in life to, to build yourself up and to work on yourself, it's a lot harder. And you got to put a lot of hours into building a business and to building a successful real estate empire. And to do that, it takes a lot of hard work. Absolutely. I couldn't, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with anything you just said. So I'm, I'm right on board with you there. Um, so I want to go back to your story just a little bit. Um, just backtrack a little bit. Um, you were talking in 2011, you, you met your partner um, and that kind of changed. It was a big turning point in your, in your story. That is your real mm -hmm. estate career. Um, you know, a lot of, I found myself that I, I work much better when I'm with partners. So kind of go into, you know, um, doing it on your own and then having the experience of having a partner by your side and how did that kind of change the dynamic of the business um, and, and, and how you were going forward in, uh, in, your, in your goals? That's a great question. You know, everyone picture this. It's 2009 and I'm sitting in the kitchen. My brother walks in with this guy. The guy's got a suit and tie on. I'm like, hey, what's going on? I'm Jake. Hey, Jake, I'm Gino. I'm cooking Jake's chicken. Is, is that recipe named after you? He's like, yeah. I'm like, I don't even have a name after my own restaurant. You got your own because my brother was really good friends with him. So I'm cooking Jake's chicken there. And he's a pharmaceutical rep. And, um, you know, well-spoken young dude, a uh, hard hustler worker. He would come in with a sheet. He'd have all his lunches laid out. I would know when he needed lunches. He was very diligent, really nice guy. I got along with him right away. So as far as the partnership goes, it was really value-based decision-making and our, our core values aligned. And then when I started talking to him, he's like, I'm out of New York. I can't stand the taxes up here. I hate the politics up here. I'm going to Knoxville, Tennessee. And I'm like, dude, I'm a New Yorker. Where's Knoxville? I'm like, <laughs> you know, we pull up the laptop and, it's, and we whip out LoopNet and I'm looking at deals. This is 2011. And right before he left, I'm like, Jake, when you get down there, just give me a call. Let's start looking at some deals. He had no idea about investing in real estate. He wanted to start a gym. He was a personal trainer, but that was just soul sucking for him and he couldn't scale it. So same, same scenario as me. He wanted to create some income on the side of what he was doing. So he gets down there and I start coaching him up and, you know, gave it, it actually did take us 18 months to find that first deal. He will, he moved down there. Everybody's got to listen to this, you know? He moved down there by himself for six months. His fiance at the time was living up there. So he was all alone in a new state. He took a lateral transfer with his, with his pharmaceutical company and it was tough. It was stressful. She moves down. They end up buying a house. We end up putting off the dream for a few months, but we still wanted to revisit it. That's why it took us 18 months to find that first deal. We didn't understand that brokers were the gatekeepers. We were treating brokers like they were doing us a favor when really they're the ones with the keys to the castle. So learning that, being able to show that we're credible to close, being able to show that we have a credibility book, a game plan, uh, really helped us close that first deal and helped us close our second deal three months after that. But as far as partners goes, I mean, my big general consensus is if you can't have a beer with a partner and you don't like them or her, just don't go into partnership. You could do one deal, one off. That's fine. But I think ultimately, listen, I've already spoken to Jake three times today. I've done videos with him. I'm probably going to be on the end of day huddle with him. I'm going to talk to him this weekend, two or three times. It's really like almost like a marriage. And if you don't like the person, it's going to be really hard. I think the other thing is really set out the expectations up front. We were both working at the time. You know, I had the restaurant and he was working. When we bought our first property, he said, I'm going to property manage. He got paid 10% of property manage. That was the expectation, but he was doing work for that. We had expectations up front. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. We did everything together and we didn't complain about it. And as we started growing, there was ne I've never had a call with my partner saying, you know what? I can't make the call. Like I couldn't make a call yesterday at five. I excused myself. I'm like, dude, I got a coaching call with the student. He's like, I got you, bro. I mean, and the same thing with today. I'm doing this podcast. He's doing his thing. So partners really shouldn't be looking over their shoulders and saying, why weren't you there? You pick, you pick your partner up when you're having a rough time. And that was, you know, you know, quick story on that. When we first took over the properties, Jake wasn't an entrepreneur. He was just winging it like everybody else. And I had experience with crappy vendors. I had experience with crappy residents, you know, a, re a resident, a, a an employee stole some money and I'm like, Jake, best thing in the world. You know, like, like from the story, Goodfellas or I, Bronx Tale, he owes you a hundred bucks, best hundred bucks. Just let him go. And Jake, you know, at the time, young guy, I'm going to go after him. I'm like, you want to rock through your window? You want the guy to, you know, just let the guy go. So talking that through with a partner, and that's just a small little story. But whenever you have a situation, whether it's a cable contract coming through or we're doing a $3 million refi, should we sell it? Should we not sell it? Having that 
open-ended conversation where you're throwing ideas really helps the partnership and having more more thoughts going through it's really about the mastermind it's really what, what napoleon hill talks about is that unique mastermind where you're able to be able to speak and 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 you know lock in with other people that's what partnerships should be all about there should be no ego because i'm really working my butt off for his family and he's working his butt off for my family and i think that's how partnerships should work don't have the shiny object syndrome stay in your lane expectations and i think really focusing on what your core values are and value-based decision-making. I love it. I love it. Um, and I, I like that you're kind of taking it on the perspective of, um, I mean, you're going into it as a marriage. Uh, when you mm -hmm. get a partner that, I mean, you know, it's not, there's no legal, legal document like a marriage certificate, but it is that serious. I mean, you mm -hmm. are, you're, 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 you're tying your guys's boats together. And so you really do need to be able to get a beer with them. In fact, that's the first thing that I did when I, when I met my partners was we went out for beers. Um, and so I, I, I like that mentality. I like, uh, and, and for everybody listening and watching, if you are looking for a partner, um, I would definitely, you know, if you, before you decide on one, they do need to pass the beer test because partners are their, their partners. They're going to be there, um, through there, there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs, um, and they're the ones that are, that you're going to be talking to, um, during those mm -hmm. low periods. Um, you've said so many awesome things so far, G uh, Gino. So I really appreciate you being here. And unfortunately for the podcast, we do try to keep it to 20 to 25 minutes. We're button up on the end here. I wish we could go further. Um, before we leave though, I do want to ask one last question. Um, everybody on the podcast, I always ask them this real estate. It's a roller coaster. You go up, you go down. Um, so we've all been through the ups and downs. Take us to a trough that you've had um, and give us the, the best lesson that you learned from that one. Well, one of my troughs was when I bought the property, the mixed use property back in 2000, November of 2006 up in New York, um, shiny object, didn't really know about strip malls. I bought the property and it looked great. Um, it was one of those assets that it looked really nice. Numbers worked, but I didn't know anything about the three pillars of real estate. I didn't know anything about what we call the market cycle. I didn't know about debt. I didn't know about the exit strategy. I just thought it was a great deal. And for 10 years, it was a big pain point for me. I ended up selling it at a loss, cut my losses. I lost a lot of money, over half a million dollars in that deal. But you know what? Best learning lesson, because in 2008, it opened me up to multifamily. And I said, I don't want to be competing with Amazon with a little strip mall. I learned all about market cycles. I learned all about how to select the market. I actually learned what a cap rate was. I mean, it was a very expensive lesson, but it's one of those lessons in life that you need to go through. And for me, I really doubled down on my um, on selecting my asset class and my niche. And also, it was all about due diligence, really, the three, three pillars of due diligence, which is the financial part. I knew nothing about analyzing a deal. The physical part, the inspection, I did a terrible job. And the legal part, I had illegal apartments. There was no water system in there. The chlorinator was shut off. There was no fire detectors, no smoke detectors. I had no CFOs in some of the apartments. So it was a really amazing learning lesson. And also as far as if I had a partner, my partner would point that out. I had terrible team members. I had a terrible attorney. The architect was just as bad and my inspector was just as bad. But ultimately, it's not their fault. It was me who hired them. So once again, responsibility. If I had taken the responsibility and I, and I had learned, that story and that pain point, I sold it back in 2017 when I left New York, really propelled me to get into multifamily and to say, I want to do it the right way. Awesome. I love it. So you, that, I mean, that's such a good story because you, it sounds like it all boiled down oh. to um, both experience and education. You, you ran into a deal um, that you, you know, you hadn't have a lot of experience in your due diligence. And so you didn't do the due diligence that you, that you could be doing now, mm -hmm. that you would be doing now on any deal. Um, you got into partnership with people who now, you know, you understand that weren't the best fit for you at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and then you were, you were kind of, you weren't in a niche, you weren't in a focus. You didn't, you didn't know your asset. Um, and that's so important when you're, when you're deciding um, to start doing investing is to focus on one thing and not try to do everything because you can do everything. It's definitely possible. But um, when you're getting started, you really have to understand your asset class. You have to understand how it operates. And when you don't, um, you know, there can be diff very difficult consequences for that. So mm -hmm. you pivoted, um, you chose multifamily, great niche. And, and, you know, ever since then, it sounds like, you know, it's never a smooth ride, but things have been, have been going the direction that you want. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, smooth rides, Gabe, are really boring. So, I mean, I, there's a reason you want some challenges. I mean, a little slow, but if you don't challenge yourself, you don't get out of your comfort zone. 
you're going to be stuck all day. You're not going to be doing, you're not going to be, I guess, going towards your soul purpose. And that's what we ultimately want to do as humans is go to our soul purpose and really live in abundance mindset. Unfortunately, like I said, back then I was living a scarcity mindset. Couldn't see the picture, but get out there, everybody. Get clarity on what you want and focus on it. Absolutely. Gino, I, I, I'm I glad you came on. I've loved everything you said. Um, I want to have you on again um, for this podcast episode. Um, we're going to have to cut it short. Sure. Or not cut it short, cut it off because we're at the 20-minute mark and I've been trying to be diligent about um, getting around 20 minutes. Um, so before we leave... Um, why don't you tell everybody, you know, we all need to receive things. So if someone were to bring you something, what would you want to receive? Well, well I don't know. What, what, what would I want to receive? What would I want to receive? Um, hmm, good question. Deals. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, if they just come to the website, jakeengineer.com, we're looking for education students. I mean, if you want to bring great, we have an investment. We're actually starting a fund in Q3. So I, I think in quarter three, we're going to start raising capital for a fund. Um, but just for me, I just want to spread the word about financial intelligence. That's what I want to do. People with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. I mean, ultimately, I think that's what we're all trying to do with Jake and Gino. And like I said, the last thing I'll leave everybody with, just remember, done is better than perfect. Just let's leave it off with that, right? right Gabe? I love it. I love it. And also on that note, um, Jake, and I think he mentioned it already. Jake or Gino has a podcast called Jake and Gino. Mm -hmm. um, you can get that on, you know, anywhere you can find a podcast. Um, if you liked everything that Gino said today on this podcast, I'm sure you love everything on his podcast. So hop over there, give him a listen, give him some love. Um, and on that note, Gino, if somebody did want to get in contact with you, what would be the best way to get in contact with you? Just reach out to me at, uh, you can email me at Gino at jakeandgino.com or just go on to jakeandgino.com and just check out our website. Bunches of blogs, pod code, podcasts, you can download our uh, credibility book. There's so much information on there. So that's a great place to start educating yourself on multifamily. Perfect. Jakeandgino.com. If you want to get in contact with Gino, reach out there. I will also put his LinkedIn um, URL in the show notes so you can get mm -hmm. into contact with him then. Um, Gino, again, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. I know I can speak for everybody listening and watching. We loved what you shared with us. Um, for everybody here that was with us today, thank you for showing up. Um, hit that subscribe, hit that share if you'd like the content. Um, and we look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Real Estate Investing Club. If you've watched this far, I'm sure you've gotten a little bit of value out of this. So we would appreciate it if you hit that thumbs up, share it with your friends or family, whatever it may be. And if you'd like to share or partner with us on a deal, we absolutely love partnering on deals and are always looking for quality projects. Go to www.therealestateinvestingclub.com to get in contact with one of our partners. Otherwise, I hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic day, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.